The Lifestyle Show, presented by Selena McKenzie. Now, in Katie Coleman's book called Too Young for Cancer, it tells the story of her journey from diagnosis with an ultra-rare cancer through treatment, recovery and a life-altering shift in perspective. She bravely joins us now. Welcome to the show, Katie. Thank you so much for having me. So, am I right? We're going back to New Year's Eve 2020. And can you tell us exactly what happened? Yes. Yeah, so uh, it was a day that definitely forever changed my life. Um, so I ended up being diagnosed uh, with a ultra rare stage four kidney cancer that would end up being found in the ER on New Year's Eve uh, 2020. I'd been pursuing um, various symptoms uh, for about a year and a half that everybody thought was kind of just anxiety And then it kind of all led up to this moment where I started to feel a hard mass uh, in my upper right abdomen. And I just didn't feel right about it, even after bringing it up to my PCP um, and then not being too concerned. So when I didn't seem to notice it going away, I ended up going to an urgent care um, to get it checked out, worried that I might have an enlarged liver. Um, A nurse practitioner had felt the mass um, at the urgent care, and they suggested that I go to the emergency room. At the time, they also thought it possibly could have been on large liver. And then in the ER, uh, we wouldn't end up finding a enlarged liver, but instead uh, stage four cancer. The second they put on ultrasound um, on my stomach, they were able to see the tumor. I had a 12 centimeter tumor, so that's a little bit larger than a softball. Um, and about what would end up being 15 or more tumors in my my liver. Um, so it's definitely a night that uh, kind of changed everything. I was a uh, 29-year-old newlywed uh, when we got that news, so it was a pretty big life shift. Bless you, I'm sure it was. And it's it's hard enough being diagnosed with any sort of cancer, but for you, I mean, it's so rare that apparently the number of recorded cases can, can be counted on two hands. Yeah, um, that was also very difficult to kind of navigate and figure out how to make my way through. So there's uh, single digit case reports of it worldwide. Um, What I had is typically known to be a benign tumor. And those tumors um, are a little bit more common. They're still more rare than, say, kidney cancer is. um, But they're a little bit more common. They're called an oncocytoma. And they can grow in the kidney and they're uh, completely benign when they do, except for my case, uh, which obviously didn't catch that memo when it spread to my liver, which is what gave me a stage four diagnosis. It also meant at the beginning, they weren't sure I was going to respond to treatment and uh, surgery wasn't initially an option for me in the early days due to the extent of disease I had. I just had too many tumors in my liver and, and my kidney. And so trying to find information. Um, One about my cancer was really hard because there just wasn't a whole lot of information that existed. And then also trying to find experts on my cancer uh, to help find treatments that might work. Or ultimately, I did end up getting uh, to surgery about six months in, but that took a million second opinions in between. And that all kind of had to do with the rarity of of what I ended up having. Yeah. And did you have other treatments as well? Did you go through chemotherapy and radiotherapy? Yeah, I didn't have what uh, most people consider uh, chemotherapy. Um, Most people typically think of cytotoxic chemotherapy when they often think of chemotherapy. Um, And I didn't have radiation. But what I did do is I had a targeted treatment. um, And so those are called TKIs. They target um, kind of very specific pathways where the cancer grows. And I was on that treatment for about two and a half months before I eventually ended up making it to surgery. Well, I know that amazingly you promised yourself to dedicate your time in the future to make things better for other patients. And you've certainly done that by writing your book. Uh, You've been doing social media, speaking engagements and and research. Um, And it says here you've had tremendous support from your husband and some innovative doctors as well. Yeah, definitely. I there's so many people um, that supported me along the way um, and are part of of why I'm in the position that I'm at. A lot of that was my husband who stood by me 
every step of the way, which I couldn't have been more grateful for. We had been married just two months prior to when I was diagnosed and we hadn't known each other for actually that long before we got married either. Uh, we met just before COVID um, moved into with each other very quickly um, and then spent the entire uh, kind of pandemic in a house together all day, every day, and just that we couldn't live without each other. So um, we ended up getting married um, pretty quickly into our relationship. And so having this heavy of a diagnosis right after getting married, um, I wasn't, we were still learning our relationship um, in many ways. And so I just could not have done any of this um, without him because he was, he was there every step of the way for me. Um, And then I did end up finding a team of doctors across the country. Um, I have seen physicians at MD Anderson in Houston uh, that were a big part of not only my care, but also teaching me about uh, kidney cancer and helping influence the advocate that I uh, would one day become. And then the team of doctors at the National Cancer Institute or the National Institutes of Health um, in Bethesda, Maryland, in the U.S., um, played a massive part um, in where I am today. They took a chance on me with a very, very large surgery. And that is kind of the pivotal moment for me that um, changed everything. That was a very high risk surgery. It almost didn't happen. There was a massive blood shortage and they were requiring a very large amount of blood for my surgery due to a bleeding disorder that they had found. And there was a moment where I felt that slipping through the cracks and that was really kind of my only shot um they didn't didn't have a great prognosis at the beginning it was hard to give me a prognosis because what i had was so rare but the only one i could get didn't think that i was going to be here uh, much longer or much past six uh 12 months to 18 months and so that surgery had a chance to offer me a shot at a cure and it was almost slipping um right through the cracks and right in front of me. And there was a very pivotal moment through that, that um, I made a promise to myself that if I ended up making it to and through that surgery, that I would dedicate whatever time it did give me. We weren't sure if it was going to be successful. It hadn't been done on another patient uh, really like me before um, in this context. And so It was a bit of a gamble, um, but it was my best option. And so I promised to use whatever time I was given through that to making things better for other patients, especially if I did end up on the other side of that in a place that I could reach no evidence of disease. And uh, between that surgery and a a, uh, tumors burned out of my liver, it's called an ablation, um, a few months later, um, I currently have no active cancer. I've been on active surveillance and um, and no longer on treatment. And so that's kind of been my biggest mission um, and life purpose, honestly, at this point is kind of holding true to that promise. And this book was was part of that. I donated my book deal and I donate um, my full portion of the proceeds to be able to go back and help research for, for rare cancers. That's amazing. And it just shows you, doesn't it? You can't always accept what the first doctor tells you. If you do your research and you find the right person, I mean, your prognosis is great. You've got a future ahead of you where I'm sure numerous doctors told you you hadn't. Yeah, it's it's I can't overstate the importance of it to learn about whatever you get uh, diagnosed with. I think very few people will make it through life without having some type of diagnosis and, and or encounter with the medical system at some point in their life. And it's so important to educate yourself about your disease because not only does it help you understand the information that you're receiving from doctors, but it also helps you understand when you might need a second opinion. There's The medical system is so vast and there's especially cancer. Every single cancer is very different from each other. And kidney cancer, even the subtypes of kidney cancer, the different kinds of kidney cancer are very, very different from each other and respond differently to treatment. And unless you really kind of empower yourself to learn about your disease, it's difficult to pick up on if the specialist that you're seeing really specializes in the area um, that you need. And so I'm a big advocate for learning as much as you can about your disease, not only to be able to advocate for yourself 
in your appointments, but also to identify when you might need a, a second opinion. Not everyone ends up in my shoes where you need to get as many uh, second opinions as I did, obviously, but it can even empower you in your appointments with your, your physicians with just even routine ailments as well, too. Yeah, here, here. And I know from your website that you do podcasts as well. And I'm just reading about COA or COA. What's that? Yeah, so COA is a nonprofit that I started at the beginning of last year. And it is to fund research for chromophobe kidney cancer. So chromophobe kidney cancer is not the type of cancer that I have myself. I have a you know, metastatic oncocytoma. But chromophobe kidney cancer is a type that's most similar to mine. And when I didn't have very many treatment options and we weren't sure if I was going to respond to treatment, we modeled my treatment plan after chromophobe kidney cancer. There was also a point in time that we thought I might have had chromophobe kidney cancer and I connected with a group of other young patients who were all diagnosed with chromophobe kidney cancer all around the same time as well. And when I learned about the limited treatment options, this is a type of kidney cancer that doesn't have any dedicated treatment options to its biology, and it can be less likely to respond to the existing treatments. And so when my prognosis improved, I kind of made it my life's mission to help um, patients with chromophobe kidney cancer help their prognosis improve. And I actually, uh, today I'm even taking this call from um, Boston um, in the U.S. where I'm visiting uh, a lab that studies chromophobe kidney cancer. Wow. Uh, because there's there's so few um, researchers that study this disease and funding research is, is crucial. So that's what I started my nonprofit for and um, what I've dedicated all those efforts towards. I know that you're um, a software engineer. Would you like to get more into the medical field or, or is it more of sort of a sideline for you? Yeah, so I actually did pivot my uh, career after my diagnosis. So I uh, am a software engineer. I used to build software used at racetracks, um, so in motorsports. And after my diagnosis, I created a few websites. Um, one of them I actually pushed live from the hospital as I was getting uh, tumors burned out of my liver. And that one was to help patients with um, complicated medical uh, care to be able to organize their doctors all into one place because everything was all in different systems for me. And I figured other patients could use that too. And then as I continued to build those tools um, and a couple other websites, it actually led to me pivoting into the space. And now I'm actually the product and engineering lead at the, the Rare Cancer Research Foundation, where I, I get to use my skills as a software engineer to help other patients with rare cancers as well too. That's incredible. Well, this book is for anyone who's looking for proof of the human spirit. Uh, it's called Too Young for Cancer, One Woman's Battle for a Diagnosis and a Fighting Chance. It's by Katie Coleman, who we're chatting to now, and we're selling it right now on our website, tre.radio. Now, I've mentioned your website, Katie. Do you want to give out your website address? Yeah, that'd be great. So um, my website is katiekickscancer.com. And it has uh, all the information about my book, webinar, and nonprofit kind of everything that we just talked about is all on the site there, too. Well, I think you're amazing. Thank you so much for being with us on today's show, Katie. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye.